Good afternoon. I'm David Runkle, the Deputy Director of the Institute of Politics, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's program, which is an expansion of two of our fall study groups. The uh, study group leaders are our fellows, uh, two of our fall fellows th this year, and I will, I will ask them to introduce their guest. But the uh, two study groups have been looking at a two-party South. Governor Holton, uh, former Governor Holton of Virginia, has been leading that group, and he, he's, it's a call to two-party South, even though it votes as a, a block and has voted as a block in presidential campaigns. And, uh, and Matt Reese, a, a consultant on the Democratic side on numerous campaigns, has been leading a study group on uh, how to get the voters to do what you want them to do. I'll turn the program over to Governor Holton. Thank you, David. And thanks to all of you. Uh, we normally, in my study group, talk about two-party politics in the South. But when we were planning these sessions, uh, we concluded, and I'm sure that Matt Reese and his advisors similarly concluded, that everybody today would be talking about something else than two-party politics in the South. We are most fortunate with the two guests that we have. Uh, you recognize each of them, I'm sure, and that's why you're here. We're going to be very brief in our comments because we're going to come very promptly to the questions that are on your mind. And I will first introduce Mr. Sears and then Mr. Reese will introduce Mr. Squire. John Sears and I have been politicking together uh, since 1966. His reputation was made when, um, before some of you all remember, he made a new Nixon. There have been several Nixons, and he made one of the new ones. He, uh, he did the kinder, gentler one. <laughs> he made the kinder, gentler one. <laughs> I'll let him explain what happened to that one. <laughs> but uh, he has managed several presidential campaigns and, and been participants in presidential campaigns uh, several times since then and as you know has come to be uh, something of a national figure for uh, analysis and wisdom in analysis of presidential campaigns and presidential races and presidential results. John, I'm not going to tell any more about you. You may reveal what you would like and I am happy to present my friend John Sears. Thank you. Thank you. It's a special pleasure for me to be here with my good friend, Linwood Holton, who has been one of my best friends in politics for over 20 years, as he's noted. Um, I think the best day in his career, however, was when he did win the Virginia governorship, which no Republican had ever done in 1969. And I can't recall the color of the car. I think it was red that he drove up to the White House in. <laughs> Obviously, having come from uh, sort of an all-night celebration. <laughs> and so he didn't start behaving like he was governor for a couple of days. And I thought that was, uh, that was especially wonderful. Anyway, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the election. Uh, most of you have read uh, as much as I have about it. Uh, uh, the popular vote is holding at about 54 to 46, it seems. Uh, interesting sideline to that. Somebody told me this morning, and I think it's probably true, that if you took the South out of the results, that the popular vote would have wound up about 50-50 in the rest of the country. Uh, in my mind, this is a campaign that uh, Dukakis lost, uh, and through no fault of Bob Squire, my good friend to the left, uh, after Bob joined the campaign a few weeks ago, uh, they began to do things much more intelligently and made up a lot of ground. Uh, but the time was not enough uh, for him to make it all the way. But previous to that, uh, they'd been guilty of tremendous errors in judgment and tremendous errors in tactics and strategy. Uh, we don't really have time to mention them all, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that you know you have going for you if you're going to run against the Vice President of the United States is that anything you can think of that the people don't like about the incumbent administration, uh, you can uh, make sure that the Vice President is forced to stand up and defend those things. Now, Reagan personally was quite popular, that's true, 
Uh, but there were a large variety of things that had gone on in his two uh, terms as president that uh, I think uh, Mr. Bush uh, could have been forced to stand up and uh, defend. Uh, there was the fact that uh, during the Reagan years, more people uh, were indicted and went to jail who had been in public service. Uh, Mr. Bush, in having to answer questions about that uh, before he got to the fall campaign, uh, found himself having to uh, defend these individuals, and I think could have been forced to do so by Mr. Dukakis if he had been adroit at all. Uh, you know, we all wander around the streets, and uh, I think all of us, no matter what we think is the right answer to it, uh, feel very badly that we see all these people out sleeping on grates, uh, obviously uh, not enjoying life to the degree that the rest of us can. And that bothers us, because we didn't see that some years ago. Now, Mr. Bush's uh, last statement on that subject, uh, when he was forced to answer about it before the fall campaign, was that many of these people preferred to do this. Well, uh, if I'd been Mr. Dukakis, I would have gone out and found one guy uh, who didn't prefer to be sleeping out there. And I think I could have made as much out of that as was made out of uh, the, uh, the fellow that Mr. Dukakis let out of jail. But, uh, you know, you could go on. There are many other things that could have been used in this. But uh, Mr. Dukakis seemed not to understand that you could do these kinds of things. And uh, so there was no holding of the vice president accountable for what had gone wrong in the Reagan uh, eight years. The second thing I'd say that was a very fundamental uh, mistake on Dukakis's part was that he assumed everybody would sort of know uh, him as the kind, decent, uh, wonderful, moderate gentleman that he knew himself to be. So he didn't bother to spend the time and the effort to establish his image uh, with the electorate. Uh, what he did do is thereby is let his opponent fill in the blanks about himself, because anybody that runs for president having only been the governor of uh, Massachusetts uh, there are a lot of blanks about you. Uh, so he allowed George Bush's campaign to fill in those blanks. And of course, whenever you do that in politics, when you let your opponents fill in the blanks, you're going to lose. Uh, they're not going to be fair about it. Uh, and in this fashion, we came to know that Mr. Dukakis uh, wasn't uh, such a nice fellow, that seemingly he didn't believe in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, uh, seemingly, for some strange leader, uh, reason, he was prone to let uh, convicted murderers out of jail on furlough so they could rape people. Uh, seemingly, uh, he was masquerading as somebody he wasn't by pretending to be a moderate person when, in fact, he was some kind of wild-eyed liberal. Uh, now, most of these matters didn't have much to do, that were brought up in this area, didn't have much to do with whether he'd be a good president or not because presidents don't have much to do with Supreme Court decisions about uh, when and where you can give your pledge of allegiance to the flag. Uh, or indeed, uh, presidents uh, don't have much to do with crime. Crime should have been a, an issue that was working against the Republicans. They'd been in office for eight years, but strangely, after uh, Mr. Bush was allowed to fill in the blanks about Mr. Dukakis, uh, you found that the Republicans were the people that were strong on crime. So that was another very fundamental mistake that was made. And thirdly, and you could make a list uh, probably up to about 20 of things that were pretty fundamental that were wrong, but I'll stop after three. Thirdly, in his characterization of the race at the Democratic Convention, when he stood there quite proudly and said what this uh, race is about is about competence and not issues. Well, uh, you know, it's hard to prove whether anybody is competent to be president of the United States. It's awfully easy to prove that anybody is incompetent. So again, by identifying this as the central issue about his own claim to the presidency, uh, he left the Bush campaign in a position where what uh, they needed to do was demonstrate that he wasn't competent. And of course, uh, they relished this opportunity. Uh, and went forward and did so. So anyway, I do feel this is a race that was lost uh, rather than won. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Bush uh, can be proud of the fact that he came back from uh, such a, a large uh, gap that he had to overcome immediately after the Democratic Convention. 
Uh, those polls were accurate, too. Uh, they showed that people had a very low opinion of George Bush. And uh, they were registering that by saying that they would vote for this fellow Dukakis uh, in favor of Mr. Bush because they had a very low opinion of Mr. Bush. When you see that in a poll, uh, you should hold back from thinking that support. Uh, what it is is it's interest that's coming to you because people don't like your opponent. And if you're smart, you move while that lasts and go talk to some of the group groups that seem to be interested in you because they don't like your opponent and prove to them there are positive things that they can support. Uh, then you may uh, benefit from it. If you don't do that, uh, it's likely to change very quickly once the fellow who's the subject of all this scorn, Mr. Bush in this case, uh, begins to operate on his conditions. So Mr. Dukakis... Uh, didn't choose to speak about any issues. Uh, he thought in some fashion that uh, this 17 point lead that he had at the beginning of the race would just continue. Uh, and, uh, you know, he just didn't do anything very correctly here. Mr. Bush will have problems in Washington. Uh, one of the first ones he faces will be the fact that he has uh, told the country to read his lips over taxes. Um, even most of the Republicans in Congress would tell you that uh, they expect there will have to be more taxes. Uh, the Democrats don't see any reason uh, for being of any real assistance to Mr. Bush. And I might say that even Mr. Dole on the uh, Republican side, um, whose record on trying to uh, raise taxes to balance the budget uh, is well known and was uh, referred to by Mr. Bush when he beat him in the New Hampshire primary, uh, we'll be happy, too, I think, uh, to uh, administer a few body blows to make up for old uh, scars and wounds here. Uh, so you, you can bet that the Congress will force Mr. Bush uh, to sort of eat his words over taxes, and they'll do so quite quickly. Uh, actually, this is one good result that comes out of uh, bad feelings in politics because the country perhaps will benefit from all the statesmanship. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, I, I could go on quite a lot more. I'll turn the thing over, though, to Mr. Reese, uh, who I've also known for a long time, and my good friend, Mr. Squire, and uh, we'll look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, Bob Squire started in uh, consulting business uh, um, just two years after I did. I don't know. It's been an easier life for him. Uh, um, uh, he... Uh, uh, when you go to a, a Democratic uh, meeting, a gala or a dinner in uh, Washington, the, uh, most of the people who sit at the head tables are Bob Squire's uh, uh, candidates. Uh, he's probably, he's, uh, doubtless, the most successful of the Democratic uh, political consultants. Uh, there's a score of more United States senators that he's worked for. Uh, to go down the list of this year, uh, he's worked for Byrd and Sasser and Mitchell and Robb. No heavy lifting there. But uh, he had uh, Lautenberg and Lieberman, uh, Evan Bayh in uh, uh, Indiana for governor, and one he's sweating out, uh, Buddy McKay down in uh, Florida. He also did something that, that he hasn't done much, much uh, I'm told, uh, he worked on an, an initiative, this one in Maryland, this one against the NRA, who came there to try to, to remove from the uh, uh, statutes a gun control, uh, the Brady Bill, a gun control bill passed last spring. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, uh, those are the sort of things that... Uh, Bob Squire is proudest of. Uh, he's uh, his honors are uh, are um, uh, uh, lengthy. I won't go through them because it always makes me jealous. Uh, he, 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 there's another side to him, or there's several sides to him. One of them is uh, uh, he he uh, he does documentaries, uh, films, uh, and he's most recently on Herman uh, Melville. Uh, uh, William Faulkner. He's now editing uh, something on Hemingway and has plans uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Tom, Thomas Wolfe, and uh, Robert Penn Warren. 
So uh, in his spare time, he does that. He's a very engaging fellow, and I'd like to introduce Bob Squire. I started in this field at the age of nine. We called him Pops. <laughs> but what I thought I would do is try to fit together what I said with what John said, because uh, as you'll find there, uh, we, we generally agree on almost everything, especially after an election when partisanship is washed away by the, by the votes of uh, the electorate. Um, what I thought I'd do is describe uh, in sort of my own kind of uh, twisted way what I think happened in terms of getting here, why we ended up with these two candidates uh, running against each other, and then uh, a couple of comments uh, that I might add to what John said about uh, the, uh, the general election and then uh, get to your questions as quickly as uh, we can. Uh, I guess uh, any uh, uh, run through the candidates that, that ran uh, in this election would have to start with my friend Gary Hart. I, had, I should say, by the way, I started out with five former clients all running against each other for president this year. So I did what any brave person would do, and I just ducked the whole thing until uh, the last two or three weeks. Uh, Hart's problem, uh, I, I believe, and I've known him for a long time, is that what he wanted to be when he grew up was not to be president, but to be Warren Beatty. Um, <laughs> Beatty, on the other hand, wanted to be <laughs> Gary Hart. Uh, and uh, fortunately, only one, one of them got his way. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the, the, the problem that faced Babbitt in the election was that he, he honestly believed that the press uh, could uh, deliver delegates. And when he found out that there were no delegates uh, to be delivered by the press, uh, he soon, uh, soon fell by the wayside. Uh, Gore actually, uh, actually won. Gore got to be president, uh, but it was only of the Confederacy. Um, and uh, I think we'll see more of this young man uh, in the future uh, because I think he did very well in the general election uh, uh, campaigning for Dukakis, trying to wash away some of the sins uh, that, uh, that he had committed uh, uh, in, the, in the primaries. Uh, Jackson, of course, uh, found out that the presidency is not an entry-level position, uh, but he, is, he, is, he has also found out that he has a permanent job in the Democratic Party. I don't think we're ever going to be able to take that airplane away from uh, Jackson. <laughs> Gebhardt was interesting. He was, uh, he was sort of a day and night job. Uh, by day, he was a populist. By night, he, he liked to hang out with the lobbyists. And, uh, and finally, in, in, uh, in Iowa, some enterprising reporter decided to film him all day and all night. Uh, and the day that the uh, lobbyists flew into uh, to, uh, Iowa to deliver all the dough to this guy uh, standing out there with uh, uh, you know, a straw in his mouth, uh, I think was the day that his uh, campaign began to decline. Uh, Paul Simon, my, my dear friend Paul, who's also a client, had one of the things that I think is deadly in politics, which is that uh, he had an unerring instinct for the capillary. Uh, he, 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 could, he could never quite bring himself to make the attack that he needed to make. And then, of course, when it was too late, they always make the attack and make themselves look bad. Uh, and that uh, it, it, sort of quick rundown uh, uh, leaves you with Michael Dukakis, uh, who believed uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Cuomo had told him uh, uh, early on last year, which was if you just keep saying that you're competent, people will believe you're competent, and one day you'll wake up and be president. He, uh, I think Dukakis probably should have been suspicious at getting advice from Mario Cuomo, because what Mario Cuomo, of course, wanted to do was wake up one morning and be president. On the Republican side, uh, I, I, Kemp, I, I think, was one of the more curious uh, uh, fixtures. Um, he's the only man I've ever seen to run through a presidential election using a, 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 a rearview mirror. Uh, I mean, literally, I think his, his, um, his uh, slogan should have been back to the future or forward to the past. Uh, I mean, this guy could never quite get straight the fact that people of your generation or even my generation uh, were no longer interested uh, in things like the gold standard. My grandfather was not interested in the gold standard. <laughs> and, and, yet, and yet here is, uh, here is Kemp out there uh, 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 parsing away with issues like that. Um, Robertson, poor guy, had a bad year. I mean, this, I mean, anybody just has to admit this was not going to be the, the year for a TV minister. With, the, with the Baker and Swaggart out there uh, doing their number, uh, this guy, the poor guy ran third as a TV minister this year. Um, next one uh, on my list is, uh, is DuPont, and I have to quote my friend uh, Harrison Hickman on this one because I, I think he hit it right on the nose. And He said that he doubted that any man could be president of the United States who had as his first name, the name of a maitre d', Pierre, uh, and the last name uh, of, uh, of a prominent environmental problem, DuPont. <laughs> Dole, now, on the other hand, did not have the problem that my friend Paul Simon had. Uh, Dole uh, does have an instinct for the jugular. The problem is it's his own. Uh, <laughs> and, and that left, uh, in that group uh, of stalwarts, uh, Alexander Haig, 
Uh, I remember watching the Republican debate in, in New Orleans uh, and turning to my wife after the debate was over and saying, God, I'm, I'm glad I live in a strong, strong democracy, a place where a guy like this has to run for public office instead of just pick it up on Saturday. <laughs> so you ended up with, uh, with George Bush uh, uh, and his resume. Uh, I agree, uh, as I said before, uh, with a lot of what John said, and let me just add a couple of things uh, uh, about uh, uh, the general election that he might have uh, passed over lightly. Uh, First, I should say that, um, that uh, anyone who is interested in the subject of targeting and television in the general election, which is obviously what my friend here is teaching, if you'll just send a note to my office in Washington, we'll send you a graph on your computer, and that will be the answer to the question in his test. <laughs> Uh, I think if, the, if you look at the two speeches of these men at the, uh, at the general election, uh, at, the, at the, rather their uh, general conventions, that you can tell a lot about them. Both of them, I think, rose to the occasion brilliantly and, and, and delivered a really first-rate speech, a speech that uh, could set the tone for the rest of their campaign. And then I think what Bush did was very interesting. I think he must have sat down with Roger Ailes, who's a good friend of mine, uh, in a videotape room someday, and, and they looked at the speech, and George turned to him and he said, Roger, is that, is that really me, you know, up there making that speech like that? And, and Ailes said, uh, oh, that's right, that's you, that's you, that's the new you. And, and he sort of tuned into that idea and sort of marched out into the, uh, uh, into the campaign and was able to replicate that speech and, and that tone uh, throughout the campaign. I think on the other hand, Dukakis took a look at his speech on videotape uh, and probably was thoroughly embarrassed by it and said, you know, my God, you know, I've, I've shown myself too much, you know, I'm, I'm not ever going to do that again, uh, and didn't uh, until uh, his press conference today where he showed an enormous sense of humor uh, about having lost the race. I think what happened uh, is a kind of a curiosity in terms of personality. Presidential elections hinge a lot on personality because we care sort of about the character of a president. We, we, we think about, are they presidential? And we're, we're a little inarticulate about what goes into the makeup of a person that is presidential. But I think what, what uh, the people around Bush did rather cleverly was to take a person who was perceived by some uh, as a man who was something of a wimp and, and turn him into uh, something different than that before our very eyes. Uh, I've come up with my own personal theory, which is not very pleasant, but then I'm not very pleasant when I talk about Republicans, that, uh, that what a wimp wants to be when he grows up is a bully, uh, and they figured that out and did that in the course of the campaign. I think what they also did was to turn their opponent uh, into the candidate uh, in, the, in the election that ended up being the wimp. Uh, what, they, what they did was they said of Michael Dukakis, um, if, if, uh, if, if you're going to allow rapists and murderers out on the streets of our, uh, of our cities and towns to attack uh, our women, then, then you're not the man that we need in, in the presidency. And on all of the issues that they drew against Dukakis, all of the attacks that were made on Dukakis, were basically attacks on either, as, I, as John said, his competence, or even worse, uh, on his personality or even on his manliness. And I think they were very successful in basically, in basically redefining who was the wimp in this race uh, and, and doing it to, to the detriment of Dukakis. Uh, they also, of course, uh, turned him into the liberal uh, in the race, which didn't start out to be a bad thing, but they were very good at defining what a liberal was. And John has pointed out, I think, very well that in, a, in politics, when you, when you see a, 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 uh, a vacuum out there, uh, the first thing a smart uh, opponent does is to fill it in. And, and you had here two, ca two candidates that were not very well known in this campaign. Um, even though Bush had been vice president for what seemed like forever, uh, and uh, Dukakis had been governor of the state for what seemed like forever, uh, these two men weren't re re terribly well defined out in the country. So what they had to do was to go about the job of defining themselves and the other guy. Bush started right away to define himself uh, this sort of, in this, and it was kind of a two-track two -track strategy, the kinder, gentler uh, Bush, and he would then, uh, and then ma make his attacks upon Dukakis and try to define Dukakis as someone who was incompetent and too weak to, to handle the job. And many people were confused by that strategy. They would complain about the fact that one day you get one Bush and one day you get the next. But the strategy was very consistent. When he was the kinder, gentler guy, he was talking about himself and trying to make the case for himself. When he was the other half of it, the evil twin Skippy of my, uh, my, my, my friend Gary Trudeau, invented, um, he, he, was, he, he was making the attacks uh, on, uh, on Dukakis. And really, uh, uh, Bush and his evil twin did a very good job of running right on straight down through this uh, campaign, one saying good things about Bush and the other one saying bad things about Dukakis. Dukakis believed that, that, was, that, that it was beneath the process to, to step, up to the, uh, step up to the plate on those attacks 
and said something very interesting in the campaign that often these candidates will say things that are very important, but we don't get it until after the election is over. And one of the things he said early on in the campaign was that this is a marathon. Well, I think the Bush people looked that over and said, we can't win a marathon, so we better not have a marathon. What we ought to have here instead is a slug out. Let's just have an alley fight uh, and see if we can win an alley fight. And so they defined the race as an alley fight. They just started slugging away at Dukakis. And Dukakis, thinking he was running a marathon, tried to avoid it. Well, you end up in a situation where you're not defending yourself against these attacks. And that in itself begins to look like a sign of weakness. Again, part of their strategy of attacking his personality. So I think in the, I, I, the saddest words I heard were, were uh, where my friend John Sasso last night after the election was over saying that they just had another week. You know, I sat there in my, uh, in my office screaming at my television set saying, you know, John, you had another week. There, was, there were several of them in August and September. Uh, and the problem with that campaign is that it, it didn't get started when the other side started. Uh, the fight began and, uh, and they refused to defend themselves and ended up at the end running out of time. Um, I guess the, that's about all I have to say about it, except that it was kind of interesting, it seems to me, that, the, that in picking the idea of competence, in the end, Dukakis was probably choosing his opponent's playing field. All that George Bush had to run on was that resume of his. And when you say competence, sometimes a resume that's just got six or seven jobs on it looks better than a resume that's got two or three jobs on it. So in the end, I think even the, even the uh, playing field that the Dukakis people set out for themselves uh, strategically was a bad one because it would have ended up uh, being on the, uh, on, in, in uh, Bush's own backyard. I think Bush had to run a perfect campaign, and Dukakis had to make several mistakes for this thing to, uh, to end up in the result it has, and that's what happened. Well, uh, uh, there are more. Yeah. Yes, we don't have any microphones on the second floor for questions, but if you do have a question, why don't you approach one of these microphones? Do well, thank you very much. No. <laughs> uh, John, do you want to, to uh, say anything in, in response to. Uh, well, I Bob? think we might have a question coming uh, Just a question about. Would you like to identify uh, yourself with? Uh, Philip Hyde, I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, a question about uh, whether this really was a referendum on liberalism, uh, to the extent that uh, we now are looking for candidates who are um, from the South, Sam Nunn, and those types, or whether, because Michael did close the gap so greatly in the last few weeks, and uh, they, he, he, they were able to define liberalism not as it really was, whether this can be a, a case can still be made for a strong liberal candidate for the Democratic Party. Uh, I don't think liberalism is the problem. Uh, I don't think conservatism is a problem either. Uh, you know, they happen to be words that uh, ring a bell with, uh, oh, maybe 30% uh, uh, of the electorate. Uh, no more, really. Uh, other people are interested in the words because they tend uh, to think they describe people but they will not automatically vote for or against somebody who's a liberal. So I don't think the problem is being liberal. I think the problem is uh, when you say you're against the death penalty and somebody asks you uh, at the debate uh, what you, uh, if you still would feel that way if your wife was murdered. And uh, you think for a moment and say, well, yes, I still would be. Uh, that's a problem if you're a liberal. Uh, now, Mario Cuomo has been asked that question down in New York in running for governor, and uh, both the Republicans uh, and the press quit asking it of him, because when he was asked, uh, you know, if he would be for the death penalty if uh, his wife was murdered, uh, he said, my wife was murdered, huh? Said, you know what I'd do? I'd kill a guy. I'd kill him. We wouldn't have to worry about the death penalty. You might have to apply it on me. But you wouldn't have to worry about it with them. <laughs> now that's an effective answer. <laughs> uh, so I don't think the problem was that Michael Dukakis was too liberal, uh, but uh, he didn't have uh, real responses for some of these interpretations of what that meant that the Republicans hung on him. And I don't think, you know, the Democrats are about to have a big internal debate about uh, some of the th questions that you're raising by your question. Uh, and the Southerners will say, well, what this election means is that uh, we can't win a national election unless we win a, uh, run a Southerner because, uh, you know, we can't let the other side have this big block of votes uh, uncontested. And that's what's been happening. Uh, and we've seen the results when we, we ran Northern liberals. So we don't need to do that again. 
um, you know, the liberal people in the party will say, basically, well, no, I think one of the reasons we lost is uh, we let others define us. Uh, and we didn't let people know what good people we are and what we really stand for. So we think we ought to talk more about the issues uh, and talk, you know, become a party that is willing to be defined as liberal. Uh, certainly that's what the conservatives said in our party after we lost in 1964 and we had a terrible bloodletting. So I, I'm pretty sure that the liberals will be saying it. The blacks uh, will fall in line with the liberals, but, uh, you know, the black relationship in the Democratic Party uh, is a very sensitive relationship. Uh, and I don't know quite what the answer for it is. Uh, it's not a matter that it's ever wrong to have support. So it's a good thing for the Democratic Party to have uh, every black voter that they can in the party. Uh, what is the difficulty sometimes uh, is if a party becomes known uh, for being controlled overly by any minority group. As my party was known for being in the control of big business well after big business had made its deal with the Democrats in the 1940s and was giving them as much money as they were giving us and getting government contracts and really felt a little upset if we were really going to stop some of this government contract stuff. But we were still known as the party of big business. <laughs> uh, we had, in the meantime, if, you know, perhaps we had done that in the 20s, but it was no longer true. And a lot of people just wouldn't vote for us uh, because that's what they thought we were. Uh, and there wasn't, you know, there were ways that people tried to change that. The only thing that did change it in the end was Goldwater ran, and everybody could see they didn't like him. Uh, and that actually uh, took care of that reputation that we had. We haven't had to live with that since. But anyway, that's too much uh, answer for your question. I'm sorry. I'll let Bob comment. No, I basically agree with what John said. I think that this was not a referendum on liberalism. What this, what happened at the end was, having said that he would that he was re he would refuse the label, uh, he then grasped the label. And again, this it seemed to me forced him into a kind of weakness. This was he, he was he was forced into doing something he said he wasn't going to do. I think you define uh, you you define the race yourself, and then you have to live by the rules that you make. And once you've made some rules in a race, uh, you're, you're 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 better off in the long run sticking with your rules and trying to win on them than trying to change the rules because you end up looking like you're weak and flip flopping. Sometimes uh, changing positions uh, can seem attractive, but boy, it is very difficult to explain it when a politician does it. Matt, do you have a comment on that? There's a question over here. Uh, I'm Howard Husick. I'm the director of the case writing program here at the school. Uh, apart from what works or what doesn't work, which is what you gentlemen have been discussing, I think there's a uh, probably an opinion extant in the Democratic Party, probably among liberals, that what George Bush did, even though it worked, was somehow wrong, that he appealed to the base instincts of, of the electorate and that the hot buttons that he pushed are buttons that one ought not to push. I wonder if you could respond to that. I have difficulty sort of dealing with a question like that because it seems to me that if it exists, then you've got to deal with it. And if they were, if he's hitting those hot buttons, then you've got to deal with those buttons uh, in response to that campaign. You've got to deal with the campaign that you're dealt. You know, you can't just wish that somehow the campaign were something else than the campaign that you've run into. So, uh, so uh, you know, I guess in a better world, we would uh, we would uh, run campaigns that were that were on real issues rather than. Uh, than uh, campaigns that uh, that uh, tend to, to talk about things which we all know probably on both sides are, are, are things that don't really divide us. Uh, I, I'm one of the minority that thinks that probably a campaign is a bad place to, to really have a serious discussion about big national issues. My guess is that those discussions are best held in a, in a room with no recorders uh, among uh, honest people who are trying to find a solution to the problem. I think uh, what Bob said is uh, a commonly held feeling uh, that, uh, and part of it is because uh, television's uh, uh, attitude and uh, incapability of holding an extended discussion about anything. Uh, television is essentially uh, an entertainment medium, and when you apply that to, jour to journalism, uh, what television likes to do about campaigns or news uh, is really to convey emotions. That's one of the reasons, uh, because that's entertaining, I think. Uh, that's the reason every night if you watch the local news you see how many murders uh, have occurred and how many rapes and how many drug uh, incidents uh, because those are all emotional experience and in politics the emotion is who's winning and who's losing. Uh, it isn't some extended discussion about free trade. So it is difficult to have such a discussion as Bob says. I however will say 
I think George Bush made a bad decision uh, to run this kind of campaign. Uh, and perhaps he had to do more of this than you usually do just because the opportunities were there and it's hard to pass them by when you are behind as he was originally. And Dukakis uh, had given you the opportunities. But certainly once he got ahead comfortably, I think he wound up losing ground by, because of the kind of campaign he ran. Uh, and once he was ahead, I think he could have afforded to be more presidential, uh, to discuss his own plans perhaps about what he intended to do with the Russians, which is a matter that I think would be somewhat interesting to most of us. Uh, his own ideas uh, about uh, whether uh, free trade was uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, now, you know, I don't have grave difficulty with his capability to make uh, decisions about free trade in office or to conduct our affairs with uh, the Russians, but what the country knows about him right now, uh, that he's a pretty unprincipled gut fighter. That's what they know about. Now, there's an odd kind of strength in that, uh, but on the other hand, he has no mandate from the people to do anything with the presidency. And I think uh, and that's, that's the risk he took, and uh, that's the reason I think it was a mistake. You need to come into office able to say to the Congress, well, you heard what I said out there. Now I'm going to do it. They voted for me. Uh, then you can have some influence over the Congress. That's what Reagan did in 1980. Uh, if you don't do that, you wind up in office with no power, and it's a pretty lonely place to be when you don't have any power. This question is worth a little more examination, I think. It, it, so, so, remove from your question the idea that the attack was negative and just assume that the attack was repetitious and, the, and, and it was the same attack. I think in, a, in, in an argumentation, which is what a campaign is all about, if you make the same exact argument in, in the same style with the same look to it over and over and over and over and over again, at a certain point you reach saturation. I mean, it's as if you say, you know, look, that, you know, you're, you're sitting here and we're debating, and I'm saying, you know, John Sears is a son of a bitch. You can just tell by looking at him, he's a son of a bitch. And he, you know, he tries to defend himself, and it's my turn again, and I say exactly the same thing, and then the same thing again, and the same, pretty soon you're going to have me, you know, carted away in a, you know, in a funny suit, because you think I'm a nut. Well, I think that is, that is all the more the problem when the attack is a negative attack. If the negative attack is the same attack and it goes too far and too long, it begins to draw attention to itself just because it's be, it's become incredibly boring. It's a, it's a you know it's it's become a headache to the voter. Uh, and I think I think he made that mistake in the campaign and actually gave Dukakis the foothold in the campaign to come back. Uh, and and I, I don't think we ought to leave here saying that, that that George Bush's people ran the perfect campaign because I thought in that one day when he's talked about you know you're going to see a kinder gentler candidate from now on and four graphs later took another whack at Dukakis you could tell that they were beginning to have a problem in their campaign in terms of deciding when to turn off this negative or at least turn to another one. And I think uh, if, if I would have been advising them, I would have said, if you want to keep the pressure on the guy, then what you've got to do is move the argument to a new, to a new level or to a new stage. Either use another piece of the same crime argument to go after him or move it on to defense or to some other area where you think you have an opportunity to go after him. But by the same, using literally the same arguments, the same lines and speeches, the same commercials, they eventually, I think, made people very tired of it and gave Dukakis an opening. I'm William Lanouette from the Press Politics Center. Um, you haven't mentioned much about the vice presidential candidates, and I'm wondering, with all the wisdom that was flying around by the pundits during the uh, campaign, could you explain to us why Quayle didn't really hurt Bush very much and why Benson didn't really help uh, Dukakis? I think they failed to exploit the, the, uh, the Quayle problem early in the campaign. Uh, I think after the debate between the two of them was the time to make an attack. I'll, let me tell you a story from the campaign that I can tell now. Uh, when we did the, the, the half-hour broadcast that was on the air, what, the night before last? Mm -hmm. Seems like three years ago already. Um, and uh, when we were talking about the, the, the rough cut of the, uh, of the show with the staff uh, of, the, of the campaign, the question came up, how far should we go with Quayle? I wanted to go after Quayle in the program, and uh, they agreed with that. Uh, but there was some thought that we ought to actually go back to the Benson piece uh, from the debate and use that in the show. And I thought it would mar the show and sort of wouldn't work in the show just from the point of view of, of programming. Uh, and so said to them, look, this is a, this is a commercial, actually. It's, it's, not a, it's not a segment for the show. It's something you should have made as a commercial right after the debate. 
And uh, Susan Estridge, who is a, a person I respect a great deal, said to me, uh, I'll make you a deal. She says, I'll keep these people from making you put that in the show if you make the commercial. Uh, so that afternoon, I went over to a studio and made the commercial. I think they only ran it uh, about two nights. But basically, it was a uh, uh, white lettering on a black background. It said, before you vote, and then the, the next line appeared, think of this. I'm sorry, remember this. And then you go to Quayle making his comparison to John F. Kennedy. I cut out all the stuff in the middle that was the moderator be, be, that took place before Benson actually had a chance to speak. So you just have Quayle finish, and it cuts to Benson, and he just demolishes him. And then the crowd explodes in, in, uh, in uh, sort of uh, applause and laughter. The camera then cuts to, to Quayle, and we freeze on Quayle as the crowd is still shouting and screaming, and we supered over his face, President Quayle, question mark. I think that, that that kind of attack on Quayle earlier in the campaign would have helped focus attention on, on him as a problem and maybe began to give them an opportunity to get on the, get on the offensive. They just never, ever were able to get on the offensive in this yeah. campaign. They, were, they ran the whole race on the defensive, and you, you don't score points on defense. I think in this in this sport, I think that's basically true. I think Quayle did hurt uh, uh, George Bush, uh, and um, you know, yet uh, it wasn't his total undoing. I think you could uh, demonstrate that he hurt him. Um, now, going back to the time he was actually picked, uh, I would have thought the way to raise this issue, because you can always count on the press to get in and examine and re-examine anything personal about it. You, need, you don't need to do that yourself these days. Um, but you see, this was the first example of George Bush's judgment. It was a judgment question. Now, after a while, after the press had, you know, regurgitated all it could about Quayle personally, uh, Dukakis began to say that a little bit. But you should have been saying that from day one. And you should have been prepared, after you did that for a couple of weeks, to come up with other uh, evidence that was favorable to you of George Bush's poor judgment. So that now you had a list. Uh, there was no attempt to go beyond Dan Quayle on any questions of judgment about George Bush. There was plenty to look into about that. He'd held a lot of posts, and there'd been long articles written in the press about his lack of judgment. So you could have done it, but they didn't do it. Uh, and so, you know, uh, as Bob was saying, they never took the offensive with it. Now, I think, you see, for Benson to be effective, and you're asking why he wasn't more effective, for him to be more effective, the top of the ticket had to be doing better uh, in, in this argument with George Bush. Then he could bring votes in the South. But it never was. And so he couldn't do anything about it. But if Dukakis had Bush explaining things, so that his, uh, you know, uh, situation looked more rational. Uh, then Benson, I think, could have made uh, Texas into a real fight. He could have helped in Oklahoma. He could have helped other places. And what John says here is interesting. You've got to listen very carefully because I think he's made a very important point. The attack was not a, a personal attack upon Quail. That would not have been an effective attack. The attack had to be an attack upon Bush's competence in making that first big important decision. Then it's, then it's between him and Bush, and Quayle is just sort of a, a kind of footnote to that argument. I am Francisco Diaz, a Kennedy, student, Kennedy school student. And how did you think uh, the, the President Reagan's figure uh, image played in this campaign? And do you think that uh, uh, Mr. Dukakis could have done something different with this uh, image of the President Reagan during his campaign? I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, I was reading an article in the paper uh, in, from the New York Times this morning coming up, uh, which I thought was a very shallow article, uh, frankly, uh, because it said, well, in the end, you know, you have to understand that uh, nobody could have beaten the Republicans this year. The country was prosperous, uh, we were relatively at peace, and, Reag and Reagan's image was wonderful. Uh, well, uh, I won't bother talking about uh, the uh, peace and prosperity uh, side to this, but Reagan's image did go up uh, during the last five months. He became more popular as president. 
But you know, I would strongly suggest to you that a good reason for that may have been that George Bush's image uh, went up during this time. Uh, it's being cited today as though Reagan sort of dragged George Bush in on his coattails. But uh, for those of you who like to guess about things that are beyond the polls, uh, I might uh, draw to your attention the fact that Reagan hasn't really done anything during this period. So uh, if you're looking for evidence of why his image went up during this period, I don't think you could find it. And I would suggest to you that it probably increased as it looked more and more like the man who was mentioning his name so often out here was a, a better man than he appeared to be earlier. This uh, allowed Reagan's image to go up. Now, I don't think Dukakis could have uh, uh, done anything constructive by attacking Reagan. Uh, Ray, it isn't because Reagan is not someone that you couldn't attack, but your business is with Bush. It's with Bush. If you're talking about anybody else uh, in the campaign, you're wasting time. You're wasting time. And that's why even when you're talking about Dan Quayle, what you ought to be talking about is George Bush's judgment, not Dan Quayle. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't be talking about Speaker of the House Jim Wright, because he's not running for president. Now, Bush did that a little bit at one point. Uh, you shouldn't be talking about anybody but Bush. So it would have been a mistake for, uh, for Dukakis to start, you know, criticizing Reagan or doing any uh, of that kind. Um, and I'd, I'd add this uh, in Reagan's case. Reagan is awfully good when he is criticized uh, at defending himself in a way that is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, out of the, the realm of what you should be doing. He, he's a good person to to uh, push it off with a little humor uh, and throw it back in your face with a little humor. He's good on his feet, uh, so you know that's another reason you shouldn't be doing it in his case. Uh, but the Reagan administration was challengeable on a lot of issues, and you could have made the, the vice president stand up uh, for some of those that happened and uh, hurt himself in the process. I agree with this. Uh, I'm Nick Daniloff of the Sharonstein Center for Press and Politics. Uh, I was rather impressed during the campaign at how categorical George Bush was on the issue of taxes, not raising taxes, opposing new taxes, read my lips, a very nice phrase that may circulate a bit more. Um, one can make an argument that taxes are going to be raised nevertheless. I won't make that argument here, but I sense that you fellows up there also see that coming. My question is, can he get off that wicket without paying a political price for it? Uh, would you look into the future a little bit and tell us whether uh, the tax increase will become uh, when the Congress overrides his veto? How is this going to happen? I think uh, uh, it's a little difficult to look into the past very clearly, let alone the future, Nick. But I, I'd say that uh, that, uh, that uh, watch my lips line is going to be a very, very difficult one for him to live down. It's, it's there. Everybody remembers it. And I think the, the, there, there is a certain amount of animosity between uh, the Democrats on the Hill and him in terms of that particular part of his uh, campaign. And, and it is his unfortunate luck that the man, the point man on the hill that's going to, he's going to have to deal with is going to be uh, uh, Benson, who has come out of this uh, in very good style, more powerful chairman of his committee than ever, bigger majority in the, uh, of Democrats in the Senate. Uh, his own personal prestige increased uh, as a result of this. And he is a very formidable man. And he has the power uh, to, to really sweat this president. Uh, and the president's out there in the, uh, in the clear. A, a chairman of a committee can, can work very carefully behind the scenes, you know, sort of moving the panels and, and, uh, and, and the fans in front of his body. But a president's out there uh, uh, pretty much in the clear. So I would think on this point that, uh, that we in the Democratic Party, uh, led by Benson and that committee, are going to sit patiently uh, by and watch uh, Mr. Bush work these miracles he has promised to this country. And if he can't, you know, then we're just going to let him sweat. <laughs> I would add to that that um, the Congress, uh, and this includes the Republicans, are quite unwilling to take the blame for raising taxes. Uh, any scenarios where uh, Mr. Bush can avoid the consequences of his political statements by being able to say that the Congress made me do this uh, are going to be doomed to disaster. Uh, there are people 
up on the Hill in the leadership positions who have been through this scenario back and forth with presidents about who's going to take the blame quite a lot. Uh, and they know how to defend themselves. Uh, and the question in the end isn't going to be really whether taxes get raised, they will get raised. It's a matter of whose taxes are going to get raised. That's what's going to create uh, the big debate. Uh, you can bet that the various users' fees, uh, you know, uh, a little extra for alcohol and tobacco, those kinds of things will certainly be done. Uh, and the issue will really be uh, how deeply into the middle class is anybody willing to tamper uh, with taxes. Now on that, uh, there will be quite a few people on the Hill that don't want to get into uh, tampering with the, uh, the middle uh, income tax uh, uh, rules that we just set. Uh, and so they may be saved. But uh, I would suggest to you, as I say, the real issue is whose taxes are going to get raised, not uh, uh, whether they will. A good quarterback uh, on a football team will pick out one person on the opposition that becomes a key for, for a lot of things that are going to happen in terms of defense. And I, I would recommend to you the person to watch is the person John mentioned earlier, and that's Dole. He already slid one in today. I mean, he is, he is, he is going to be on the evening news tonight. I saw it on CNN today. He just slid one right in on him already. And, uh, you know, and the poor man is not even in the presidency yet. Uh, and the other thing to remember is that when these campaigns get held uh, for, for Senate seats uh, uh, out in, uh, in the states, these are not campaigns that are Democrats versus Republicans. You don't even see the names of parties on commercials anymore. I can't remember the last time I put the, the Democrat on a commercial, and I can't, I've never seen the word Republican on a commercial. Uh, these, are, these races are now about what you did in Congress, and the research is very, very carefully done. And uh, these Republicans uh, become part of the Congress that Bush is going to shove out there to, uh, to, to, you know, to pass these taxes. They're not going to go for this because they're going to get chopped down by challengers uh, who want their seats. So they're going to be very, very careful of this. And uh, I would guess that, uh, that the, 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 I mean, the terrible thing about this for Bush is he's got two people he's got to deal with on this. He's got to deal with Benson among the Democrats. And on the other hand, he's got to deal with Dole as the leader of his party. And boy, I tell you, if I were, if I were you know, having to deal with those two guys, you know, I'd have a few sleepless nights. <laughs> Over here, and then we'll come to this. Well, there seems to be a re remarkable agreement on the failures of the Dukakis campaign. Would that they, they would have done better. Um, however, there, is, there does seem to be a way in which commercial television, primarily what, what people refer to as the news, there, there, uh, there's, a, there's a role that, that they play in this process, be it covering it as a horse race and the perception that people have that Bush is, has got it, Bush is winning. Or, or, more importantly, I think, is to the extent that there is mendacity on the part of the Bush campaign, that people vote for something that isn't what they end up getting, or, or fail to have the information that might have led them to vote for what in, what in fact they may have wanted and may have been better for this country. So I think that raises the question of the responsibility of the commercial, what we're stuck with for now anyway, commercial electronic media in this country that I, I would say they have failed uh, to fulfill, and I would be interested to hear what, what anybody's suggestions may be as to how to get that responsibility more adequately addressed, or, or how to inoculate people better in terms of education about the role, the insidious role, of, of television, uh, so that we can arm ourselves better uh, against those uh, influences. I think the bad news is that uh, in this, this election may have been a little bit better in terms of responsibility of network broadcasters in making big chunks of time available to examine these candidates. Uh, certainly much more than four years ago or eight years ago, or I, I, and I've been working at this since 1968. In that year, there was an enormous amount of time available. I haven't thought, I haven't, in the 20 years since, I haven't seen any campaign except this one where there have been fairly big chunks of time available. I see that the, it's an interesting uh, footnote to this. Uh, between the two debates, I had a conversation with Sasso, and I suggested that that he put Dukakis out on the road and, and basically start accepting all these invitations. They were turning these invitations down just like a candidate would as if they were ahead. And I said, you ought to just go out there and do them. If he can do them, great. If he can't, well, at least you tried. Um, and, he, and he probably helped himself, I think, although he had a couple of you know, seriously awful performances when he was absolutely exhausted. Um, that thing in Denver, I mean, evidently he was, he was virtually uh, you know, in, in a sickbed when, when he tried to go on with Koppel. 
but I think uh, uh, in this year, we probably had more in terms of time available from the networks. Now, I agree with you completely in terms of coverage. Um, but that is, a, that is a very interesting little circle you get involved in there. What, in, you know, is that the candidates performing these mini circuses you know, for, for the pleasure of the video, uh, or uh, is it being caused uh, and, and, and the effect is uh, you know, somehow emerging in the other, in, in the other direction? I, I just don't know. I, I, I think we cause some and they cause some, but you end up in a situation in which you're, we're basically just uh, running this kind of little video circus every day uh, for, for a sound bite. There, aren't any, there isn't any real give and take in a campaign anymore. You go out there and, you, and the first thing you think of that morning is what's going to be the sound bite on the evening news, and you go perform it, and then you try like hell not to perform anything else so it gets in the way of that sound bite. Yeah, oh, absolutely. We had to do another uh, whole forum on what might be good for this country. I, I thought we were just talking about how, what happened in this election. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with you. I think, for instance, that I, I, I made this suggestion to some friends of the Washington Post, and I would like to see them do it in the future. And that is what they could do very simply to, to for instance, analyzing the claims of these commercials, which are, which become the argument, argumentation of the campaign. If uh, what, what you could do at a newspaper is simply reduce the commercial back down to the storyboard that it started from. Some someplace along the line, this thing was a storyboard that's about like this. It looks like comics, and it's got the lines on it. Then go in and actually analyze what is true and what is not true of that storyboard. That's a very good way to do it in a newspaper. Nobody's ever done it. ABC, so far as I know, is the only network that actually analyzed one of the commercials in this election, literally frame by frame. And they took the, uh, they took the defense commercial with Dukakis riding around in the tank uh, and, uh, and literally would roll it along until something would happen, and then they would freeze it. And then they would point to what, 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 what the claim was on the screen and then analyze that claim and then go on to the next point. A really good analysis. They had to do that to every one of them. And, and magazines ought to do it to them. And newspapers ought to do it to them. And then the people that create these things ought to be asked, oh, when you do that, aren't you intending to mislead the public uh, and make them basically answer for the, for the material that's in these commercials? You're asking a question that uh, is... Uh perhaps more important than anything else that we've discussed today. And uh, I think Bob's right about everything that he said. I'd say this as well. We have to, in this country, uh, begin to find ways we can believe in anything. Uh, it isn't just that uh, everything we're pointed to turns out to be a little false. And that isn't just in politics, either. <laughs> Uh, in a strange way, we've all become sort of insulated uh, from the emotion of belief. Uh, because we've been taught over and over again uh, that you can't believe anything, literally. Except perhaps what you yourself can reason to or you yourself can accomplish, and therefore you know it's true because you did it. Now, uh, you could sit all day and blame television for a lot of that. And I'd say you could blame television for it. They would come back and say, well, it's all these people, and we just cover them. But you see, when you're a business, uh, basically is in television journalism, although uh, that's an oxymoron, uh, is to convey emotions about events. You're usually in the position of pointing out the one part of what you're, you're watching that's wrong because that's more emotion. Uh, and you see, when you do enough of that, and this, you know, I'm talking now back in the 60s, and I think television first, uh, first found out that it had this power to convey emotions uh, when it covered John F. Kennedy's assassination live. And two days later, the assassination of his uh, suspected uh, murderer live. And the country didn't walk around in a funk for three days. It walked around in it for years. And they went on and covered the Vietnam War, and they, people were able to feel emotionally in their houses what an awful experience this war was. Was that wrong of them to do? No, I'm not saying that. But it was certainly a new thing in our lives. 
this box in our house, it isn't a newspaper. You can throw that away. It's like your mother-in-law. She's always there. <laughs> and you can turn her off sometimes. But most of the time, you can't. Now, uh, okay, you can blame television for a lot of it. I've thought about it a lot. I think the newspapers and the print people probably have to share the blame just as much because, you see, they don't have to observe the same rules of balance that television does. They don't have to give equal time. Television does because they use the airwaves and supposedly they belong to all of us so they can get regulated by the FCC. The Constitution is quite clear, however, and of course this has been tested many times, that newspapers, printed work, doesn't have any such restriction on it. And indeed, what was true in journalism at the time the Constitution was written, and you have to assume the Founding Fathers were referring to what they knew of rather than things they didn't, was that newspapers were unprincipled in their support of whoever they liked or disliked. And, you know, very often these days you hear people say, well, what's going on in politics is no worse than Thomas Jefferson's day because, look, I'll quote to you from a newspaper about what somebody said about Thomas Jefferson. Well, that was true, but you see, there were other newspapers that were strongly for Thomas Jefferson. And they supported him strongly. So somebody wandering around trying to figure out what to do, they could make a choice. And they would get all sides if the press was free. And the, uh, the founders of the Constitution meant to have the press free irresponsibly. Now what's happened instead today is that the printed word and the magazines have adopted the rules of television. They try to be just as balanced. And if they have, when is the last time you ever heard of a newspaper or a magazine being accused or sued, possibly for some invasion of privacy or something, uh, over something, some political belief that it represented too strongly? The only cases that come up about this right of free speech are in the area of pornography. Uh, or, or sometimes, uh, you know, a, a reporter not wishing to divulge the source of his information. In my opinion, the newspapers, the magazines are still quite free to say to people, I just like, I like this guy. And here's why. And I believe him on these things. And this is what he's going to do. Because there would be quickly another newspaper that would be on the other side. But you see, newspapers don't do that. And so what you read today in the newspapers very often is just a longer account of what television told you the night before. And just as balanced. And that's true in the good papers. Television is running our lives here. And it's because we're all cooperating in it. And when you let that happen, everybody becomes, everybody in public anyway, a caricature of himself. The politicians all believe, I mean, all behave like television says they should, because it's okay. Uh, you know, most of the heroes that we have today are not the President of the United States or the normal places that you get. They're anti-heroes. In the slums, they're drug dealers. Uh, Colonel North was a hero to a lot of people for violating the law. Amazing. And how to understand how, can we, how we got this way. But it's because, partly we can't believe very easily, because we're disappointed about that, and I would add to you, we do all cooperate. I'm not saying it's television's fault. We cooperate. It. So we all go along with it. And I think the newspapers could make a valuable contribution just if they start being newspapers again. I'm sorry for going on so long. Over here. Um, do you think it's possible for the Democrats to win a national election, or do the Republicans really have a lock on the Electoral College? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's possible for the Democrats to win a national election. Uh, uh, they're going to have uh, difficulty uh, doing that maybe uh, soon unless they can just run against George Bush. Uh, they may be able to do that in four years and win. 
let me give you an example of uh, the difference between the two parties. Um, if, uh, if Michael Dukakis had won this election, do you imagine that today at his press conference he would have stood there and announced that John Sasso would be the next Secretary of State of the United States? Not a chance. And yet, that's exactly what happened on the other side. What's the point of that? The point is that uh, in the Republican Party, if you want to be a part of that administration, then by God, you're going to come out into the field and you're going to be a part of that campaign. And you're going to, you're going to dirty yourself as everybody else has to do in order to win it. The Republican circle was, was uh, with amazing regularity a cadre of very, very accomplished professionals to, to run their national campaigns. I would dare say that, uh, that Bob Dole would have been the nominee of the, the party if he had cut the right deal with uh, my friend Sears here, but uh, I'm reading between the lines, I think that uh, Dole, in the end, wasn't going to let Sears run his campaign, and Sears wasn't going to run his campaign unless Dole let Sears run his campaign, so he couldn't cut that deal. You can deny this if you'd like, or you can just sit there silently. Uh, but the fact is... If he denies it, I'll affirm it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the fact is, they put together a really first-rate cadre of people uh, to do their national campaigns. We tend to, to believe in this kind of a guerrilla raid out of the hills principle, which is, you know, somebody kind of comes out of Georgia with five people, and they win the nomination, and, uh, and then that's the national campaign. The thing that's interesting about the, the Carter people is that they're the only ones that I remember that actually started that way, and by the time they got to, uh, to, uh, to the general election, pulled an enormous number of people from the party in, into their campaign uh, in order to win it. Now, when they got to Washington, they got rid of all of them and went back to being the, you know, the, the small group of people from Georgia that would run the government. But at least they did it in the campaign. I think that's one of the mechanical reasons there's a great difference between the two parties. Over here. Uh, much has been said about the, the role of negative campaigning in this election. And given the fact that uh, negative spots are very effective in driving undecideds and that uh, campaigns are still phenomenons of two opponents who are trying to take advantage of each other's weaknesses, is the consulting community going to be ratcheting up the heat in 1990 or are you going to step away a bit and let things cool off a little? <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, uh, I went to the University of Minnesota, and one of the courses we had to take was a course uh, in public health, and it was like a one-credit course, and it was an awful thing. And I remember going to, the, to one of the classes one day, and it was the one that everybody showed up for because it was of some interest to the student body. It was the class on venereal disease. Uh, and the professor, who had a good sense of humor, always called that particular class the poor old toilet seat. Uh, and uh, you can figure out what that class was all about. I think the negative spot is the poor old toilet seat of uh, political campaigns. It, it seems to me as long as the spot meets the standards of truth and fairness, and, 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 and by meeting the standard of fairness, I mean seems fair to the average voter, and it is fair in terms of its, uh, it, the case it makes, then it, then it probably makes a contribution to the, uh, to the ebb and flow, to the back and forth of a campaign. So the answer is that that's, that's my definition of a negative spot. And, uh, and my guess is that, they, that we've been using them for years in the Senate races. The reporters just don't bother to cover that sort of thing. So it's suddenly a new deal this year. Um, I would say that you see more and more of this kind of campaign, this kind of spot in, uh, in campaigns uh, at every level in the future. That you used in 86 affair a oh, fair spot absolutely, then? absolutely. Yeah, I would defend that and have defended that uh, uh, everywhere. As a matter of fact, Kit Bond uh, uh, in uh, a campaign in Florida went down to Florida last week and attacked me in the campaign and played those commercials. And they had sort of a funny effect. The reporters, after they saw him, uh, they started attacking Bond because they kept asking him about the facts in the commercials, which were absolutely, absolutely provable. Uh, he, did, he was a member of that uh, insurance company. He was on its board of directors. They did foreclose on the Petersons. Uh, they did lose their farm. Uh, and uh, that's basically what the, the commercial said. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. The effectiveness of a politician and his skills are basically twofold. Uh, I would say his ability to campaign and get elected. And number two, uh, what he does is his effectiveness as judged while he holds an office. Um, at this point, how are we supposed to separate the two, or are we supposed to separate the two? In other words, um, Mr. Dukakis, who used poor judgment in his ability to get elected in his campaign, are we to assume that um, that poor judgment can carry through in his uh, position as an elected official? And by the same token, do we look at the skill in allowing, in George Bush allowing uh, the professionals to run his campaign and mold him and get him elected? that he could take that into his office. Where do we separate the two or do we separate the two? I never know how to answer that question. <laughs> I'll give it that one to you. Well, and it always comes up, and there's no way you can. 
Uh, you know, I think most people uh, would agree that Reagan has served the country well, uh, even if we can't all agree with some of the things he did. Uh, he was a good president. Uh, we didn't wake up in the morning uh, upset because we had to look at him. Uh, he had a good sense of humor. Uh, he seemed to uh, be able to say what he wanted uh, done in the country uh, when he felt like it uh, in ways that we could understand it. Um, and uh, he seemed to be rather direct in how uh, he uh, functioned. Um, now, uh, he is a man, as we have found out, uh, who totally let people handle him. Total. Um, and I used to feel there's a big problem with that. I uh, often would try to get him, because he isn't a stupid man, uh, to be more curious. Well, he isn't a stupid man, and it is, I finally figured out, it was curiosity. He didn't have any curiosity. And he didn't like that very much, and we ultimately parted company. Uh, and so he, uh, you know, the people that uh, did uh, run him around uh, didn't force him to try to be curious. Now, I used to worry that, you know, in this kind of an arrangement, some disaster could happen. But then as I thought about it, that could only happen in this kind of an arrangement because uh, if, or if you had bad people around it. Uh, he would not do it. Uh, so I stopped worrying about it, and indeed it didn't happen. I mean, we had a little disaster over this Iran-Contra thing. Uh, but, you know, given the circumstances, we got off pretty easy in eight years. And we got a lot out of it. Now, I also worked for a man named Richard Nixon, uh, who, if he could have, would have decided everything that went on in his administration. He did realize after a while that you couldn't do that quite. Uh, but, I mean, he would have. And he tried to do as much as he could. And he was a very bright person. Extremely bright person. Competent, capable, experienced, probably the, the best suited man to be president that we've ever, ever had, and unwilling to let anybody handle him much. And we had the most terrible political disaster under him that this country's ever had, indeed leading to uh, his own enforced uh, resignation from the office. And so weighing the two things, sure, you'd like to have somebody who is halfway in between. Uh, but if I had to make a choice uh, of which direction to err in, I guess I come out of those two experiences saying, Re actually, Reagan's better. Take the one you can handle. It, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let's go over here, and then we'll come over here. In this general election, Michael Dukakis and George Bush were not the only candidates running for president. Uh, uh, as for the third parties, at least there were two of them this year that got to, on the ballot in almost all the, uh, all the states. There are other third parties as well. I would like any of you to comment about the, about the third parties, their campaigns, their uh, candidacies, and uh, their role in society, and most importantly, do they deserve to be ignored the way they are? I think it's very difficult for third-party candidacies uh, to uh, uh, participate very effectively these days. And one of the biggest reasons, again, is that they don't have the access or the money to, uh, to get on television. Uh, I think we all uh, feel that they can be important. Uh, but usually what has to happen for the public uh, to uh, get too interested in them is that they have to involve uh, uh, break-offs from one of the two major parties then the people will uh, assume that uh, they ought to at least take a look at them and see whether they were right or the people who stayed in the party were wrong. Uh, and you can get the kind of interest. Uh, I think uh, my party probably uh, m misled people into thinking that, uh, you know, getting involved in uh, holy issue campaigns uh, was a good idea. And uh, we still refer to issues, but we're much more mindful today of uh, making sure we're able to demonstrate the man who's running uh, is uh, important and good in some fashion.
I think the biggest problem that third parties have in this country uh, is the Democratic Party because it keeps uh, displaying the symptoms of a third party and upstaging any legitimate third parties. <laughs> <laughs> okay, over here. Yes. Um, I would like to know, after what we've seen uh, during these elections, if uh, J.C. Jackson, Reverend J.C. Jackson, uh, would have been a better uh, running mate for uh, Mike Dukakis. And uh, now that he has announced that he's running for 1992, I would like to know, because uh, I would like to know what uh, should he do and what uh, should he avoid to have better chance to be a nominee for the next time. If I were advising him, what I would say that he ought to do is, is decide uh, the way Bush had to do where he lives and then run for uh, serious public office in, in one of his, his, uh, two, uh, his two constituencies so that he can bring to the table uh, what amounts to a, enough of a resume to, uh, to be taken seriously as a, as a candidate, uh, as a political candidate. His problem simply is that, that uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's, uh, the, pre the presidency is not a, an entry-level position, and it's tough to, it's tough to take a, any candidate seriously, regardless of uh, race or anything else, that has never served in public office uh, before they run for president. In South Carolina, one of his states, Bob? Yes. Yeah. Senator Thurman is up in a couple of years. Do you want to take Jesse Jackson's manager's role? <laughs> I didn't say I'd take the campaign. I'd just give him advice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Bye, John. Well, uh, I just say this about it. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Jackson knows this, uh, that he has very little chance of actually becoming president himself. Uh, we could discuss why that, or that might be true or not true, but I think he knows that or he believes that's true. And I think what he is doing is uh, trying to make an expression, uh, which is a perfectly uh, good thing to do in politics. Uh, not all politics is about winning and losing. There are situations where it's just a good idea to make an expression. I think uh, for him to do that effectively, however, uh, what he needs to do is uh, not so much concentrate on taking over the Democratic Party or uh, necessarily whether he gets nominated as its nominee, which uh, I would say he might be able to do that in 1992. He might get nominated. I said before he won't get elected president. Uh, but if I were he, I wouldn't concentrate on being nominated so much. Uh, and I would turn and actually use my candidacy to do what I could uh, to bring black people who believed in me uh, together halfway with the white community. And thereafter, some black would quickly get elected president of this country. I'd like to call on the next gentleman because uh, John Silber has been my friend for 25 oh. years. Uh, and uh, knowing the quality of his mind uh, and uh, the difficulty of his questions, I'm sure he has a question for my friend John Sears. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he has a question for my friend John Sears. Well, I have a question for both of you. I, I noticed the, the criticism of Bush uh, concerning his selection of Quayle, but I was surprised that there has not been any criticism of Dukakis for the selection of Benson, and that seemed to me to be one of the most serious mistakes that Dukakis made. Not because there's anything wrong with Benson, uh, or there wouldn't have been anything wrong if the Democratic Party decided to nominate him. But in, in Texas, there were a very large number of people who weren't about to vote for Benson as, pres uh, as vice president and lose a very powerful senator. Now, if they had lost him to the, to the vice presidency, uh, he would have been uh, totally ineffective on behalf of Texas. Uh, and Governor Clements, who is a Republican, would have been able to appoint a Republican uh, to the uh, to the Senate, uh, and that would have set up a, a much greater strength for the Republican Party in Texas. So uh, it seemed to me that they they picked the worst possible candidate uh, to be Mike Dukakis's running mate. And the second thing is, when Paul Kirk decided on the format, maybe he didn't decide, but when somebody decided on the format for the debates in the Democratic primary and limited them to 90 seconds they made it inevitable that people would notice that there were seven dwarfs in the campaign because a mental giant will look like a dwarf if he's allowed only 90 seconds in which to say something. Now, I, I don't know why the Democratic Party has not considered these two aspects as perhaps considerations on why they lost. John? I, I think you should answer that, really. Well, oh, let me deal with the first one. Um, uh, I, yeah, I think that the, uh, the, the choice of Benson... Uh, 
showed a misunderstanding of the political mind of, uh, of the Texans that basically decide, uh, uh, you know, who's going to be uh, in, in public office. Our, I should say our friendship began at the University of Texas, where John and I both uh, served. I, I, I think if, they, if Benson had resigned from the Senate, uh, that that might have been the argument it would take to carry Texas. I am very glad he did not, because I feel very strongly about his being right where he is right now, and I think the ticket still not a, would have won. Uh, even if he carried Texas, I don't think this ticket would have won. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the format, um, the, 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 I think that, that, that uh, the, the Committee on Unintended Consequences have been meeting all year in the Democratic Party on, on formats for, for, for televised debates. I mean, the idea of insisting that Michael Dukakis stand up to Bush, uh, you know, to me it was lunacy. That format was very much in favor of Bush and very much against Dukakis, it seemed to me. Uh, had I been there, I would have liked to have had that, that much more informal, much more open, allowed for interchange between the two because Dukakis would have done much better in that kind of format. A formal format uh, where with short answers and only one rebuttal, uh, standing at podiums was a way that you could actually get Bush to, uh, you know, to sort of, you know, basically figure out what he had to do and then do it. In terms of the uh, primaries, I agree with you on them on the length of the uh, answers. And I think that, that one of the things we have to do as a party is to begin to take back the process, uh, or at least examine the process we use to nominate people uh, so that we can nominate some people that we can elect. I mean, we have this, this incredibly screwy system that seems to not be hooked up to uh, the, the idea of getting people elected president. It's like we don't get it as a party. We think this exercise of nominating somebody uh, has nothing to do with the general election where you pick a president. Uh, and, I don't, and I think that you, you make one point, but there are a whole lot of others. You know, why is it that the states that a Democrat has to, ca to carry uh, are not uh, focused uh, early in the, in, in, in the process? They're not at all. Time for one more question. I, my, uh, my question regards that, since this is the first day of the 1992 campaign, according to uh, none other than Jesse Jackson, uh, oh, I, I have That a is the most <laughs> awful thought I've heard today. <laughs> oh, I know, at the risk of being stoned, I'd still like to, to, uh, to ask your opinion on this. You both seem to downplay the effect that uh, ideology had in this contest, even in the, the face of a solid South voting for George Bush. Uh, and, and my question would be, uh, don't you think that if the Democrats nominate another person with the same ideological tenor as, as Michael Dukakis and send him south, that they're going to get plastered again? And if they, and if they do that, then what, uh, what does that say for the Democratic Party as it stands right now? And, and like you referred to, it's, uh, it's nominating system. Well, I think that it was not. I, I think we rarely have ideological elections. I think that, that, that candidates tend to talk ideology in the course of a campaign, but that, 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 that voters listen to all that as blather, and they try to cut through all that talk and figure out which one is the, the, the person that is the most presidential. I think uh, one of the things that was fascinating about Ronald Reagan in all of his years was that most Democrats, I think John will support me, I was one of the few that didn't underestimate him. Uh, I always thought Ronald Reagan uh, was the master of, of, of basically talking to the to the, to the part of his constituency he needed to talk to in order to keep them happy, basically the right, but giving uh, I, to the rest of us a personality that uh, was perfectly acceptable in terms of a person you could get to like and maybe even vote for. You know, my wife once voted for Ronald Reagan. I couldn't believe it. She, she actually almost broke the front door of our house the day she did it, but she did it. Uh, and, and that showed me the power of that man to, to attract votes. Uh, I think that, that, that if you end, end, end up with a candidate who was painted as Michael Dukakis was in this campaign, uh, that that would be a hard candidate to elect, uh, to, to, to take South uh, in this country in a general election. But I think that the trick, I mean, yeah, that's right, or anybody else. The trick is to, to, is to start with candidates that are not that easy to paint and then make sure you're in the battle. You know, the fact is Michael Dukakis has a very good record on, on law enforcement in the state. He's, he's good at this. Uh, and he should have been on the attack on that issue. The fact is, he was running against a man who was put in charge of the drug program for this country. And as he said in the, in the election eve broadcast, uh, cocaine's the only thing that's cheaper in this country than, you know, than it was uh, eight years ago. He's, what he's done as head of uh, the drug enforcement in this country is brought down the cost of cocaine. That's all he's done. And the, and the campaign should have been run right at him on the issue of drugs. Uh, I think it's so. So from my point of view, it's more a question of isolating issues that go, that go to make up how we feel about people as personalities uh, and, be, and, and staying in the battle on those issues. Any liberal who can be believed, when, even though he's against the death, death penalty, uh, when he says, I'll murder anybody that murders my wife, yeah. uh, can campaign any place in That's this right. country. Uh, it's the people who you know, can't answer that question. 
that have difficulty. That brings us to the end of our time, and I'm, I want to say uh, to those of you who are represented by that particular question, uh, let me point out that John Sears and I twice, in the short time we've known each other, uh, have twice faced a situation where we were told by the public and by the press because of the horrible loss of our party once in 1964 and again in 1976 after Watergate that we were finished as an institution and we have now by the grace of God and three different candidates of the Democratic Party been elected three times in a row <laughs> so don't you guys uh, give up <laughs> Most of you feel very strongly for Dukakis, and most of us understand that. I particularly well understand it because my youngest, who is a last year's Brown graduate, has just walked into this room a few minutes ago, having just today finished a 12, 14-month tour with Michael Dukakis. I'm very proud of him, and I say there's more coming up in four more years. I say that to all of you. Uh, next week, uh, Matt's study group will resume in its uh, usual location, which is upstairs, and mine will resume in its location, also upstairs, at 4 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. Thanks to all of you, and thank you for coming. Matt has it. Uh, uh, I have an announcement, if I could. If I could uh, uh, on the 29th of November, Tuesday, from t beginning at 2 o'clock going till 8, uh, we're, we're going to plan a, cam a real campaign in the Institute of Politics in the, in the large uh, 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 conference room. And uh, uh, if there's anyone, if there's any, I've got so many people here, uh, there's so many, there may be some political junkies who would like to sign up to, uh, to sit through that all eight hours, all six hours, uh, and, and then there'll be, uh, we'll also sign up people who will be in and out, who can only come in and out. And uh, Andy, it's Andy Lindstrom, and he, he'll stand right here on the edge of this uh, thing and, and sign up anybody that wants, wants to participate. Thank you all Thank very, you very much. much.